Hello and welcome to show six of Home Winemaking 101. This time we're going to be bottling the uh, green apple quartzstromina that we worked on in an earlier show. Uh, I call it gag for shot, as you may remember, for the laboring, labeling purposes. And uh, this now was started in March. It, uh, it has gone now for uh, almost two months. Uh, getting to the stage that it's at. Now, before we get going, I want to say a couple of things about the instruments. One is, we're going to use the siphon again, and we're going to siphon from the cowboy into the filling bucket, or the bottling bucket. Uh, this bottling bucket, as you can see, has a spigot attached to it, and we'll show you when we get to that point how that works. Then we also have another tube, uh, and that tube has connected to it a filling rod, and that filling rod permits the wine to go into the bottom of the bottle and fill the bottle from the bottom up, just as we did with the cowboy. And again, to avoid splashing and to avoid exposure to the air as much as possible. But let me say a couple of things about sweetening your wine. This happens to be a kit, the sweetener comes with it. During this, the steps that you go through to get it to this point, you add that sweetener. Other wines, however, and particularly if you start off with your own grapes or you start off with um, a, a different fruit that you might want to make wine out of, you want to taste that wine prior to doing your bottling because if it's not sweet enough for you at that point, this is the time for you to add that sweetener. And uh, wine stores sell sweeteners, they're uh, grape based, uh, but they do add sweetening to the wine, keeping in mind that once you put a sweetener in the wine, you can't get it out. So you have to sweeten it a little at a time, taste it, make sure that's what you're looking for in terms of taste, and uh, move on from there. The second thing I want to talk about is selecting bottles. Bottles are, uh, you can buy them new, obviously. They're a dollar plus a piece, depending on where you get them. Uh, or you can have your friends collect them and give them to you. But I'll give you a couple of words of wisdom. Friends typically, because they're not actually doing wine making, are not concerned about the sanity, uh, uh, sanitation of the bottle, well, sanity too, but the sanitation of the bottle uh, once they use the wine. Typically the wine is consumed, the bottle is empty, they throw it in a case or they throw it in a bag or whatever they do, and they don't worry about washing out the sediment or the remainder of the wine in the bottle. It should always be done. So if you ask your friends to save bottles for you, also ask them when they're done with the bottle, to just rinse it out. Run it under the sink, uh, the water, fill it up, shake it out, and that's enough to clean out any of the residual sugar that you might have in there. Because if you don't do that, you could wind up with uh, bacteria, you can wind up with mold, and if you have a moldy bottle, throw it away. It's not going to get clean no matter what you do to it. So, um, that's a little bit of tip. I, I frankly have bought maybe five, six cases of bottles uh, in the entire time that I've been winemaking and the rest have been given to me by friends and family and obviously when you uh, consume a bottle of wine you want to save your bottle because they, uh, they save you money in making your end product. Let me show you how we clean the bottle. I just took a, a bottle that a friend gave me. I haven't yet taken a label off of it but uh, I'm going to use it for demonstration purposes. In one of the earlier shows, I showed you this little device, which is connected to your sink or your faucet. And then a little cap goes on the top of it. Now, while that, when you turn the water on, nothing comes out of this top until you actually put a bottle on it and push down. When you do that, the water sprays out at a very high rate, very high pressure, and it goes up all the way to the top of the bottle and cleans out anything inside the bottle. Then once you've done that, you want to be careful to inspect the bottle. One of the ways to do that, which is convenient, is to hold it up to a light. And if you have some sort of sediment in the bottom, such as mold, uh, you will see it along the bottom. It'll be a black or, or gray substance. And uh, if you do see that, get rid of the bottle. Don't bother trying to save it because it's too late. But typically speaking, if people just simply rinse out the bottles after they use them, uh, they don't have to sanitize them or clean them with any kind of cleaner. Just simply rinse them out and they're reusable. 
There are different kinds of bottles. Obviously, uh, we have the clear bottle. You see a lot of white wines in clear bottles, and that's probably what you should be using. Although you can certainly use a dark colored, a green, blue bottles. They come in all different colors. But you should use, um, for red wines, dark bottles. And that is, again, to keep the light out of that red wine. The white wines are more forgiving, as I mentioned before, so you have an opportunity to use the white bottles and they're certainly easier to fill because you can see them uh, quite readily being filled up and, and know where to stop. So what I'm going to do first, I've already gone, gone through the cleaning and sanitizing phase of the bucket and bottles. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, show you just one little instrument that is convenient for sanitizing your bottles. One is what we call a bottle tree. This bottle tree allows you to hang the bottles upside down by simply putting the bottle on the top and letting it drain like that, okay? And on the top of it, let me step out of there for a second. On the top of it, we have a little basin. And we put the meta bisulfite in that basin, invert the bottle over it, push down a couple of times, and by pushing down, it will shoot the meta bisulfite all the way to the bottom of the bottle uh, and coat the inside of the bottle. Once you've done that, you simply hang it on the tree and let them dry for about 10 minutes as you do with anything else that you're sanitizing. So, we have already gone through that process to save you the uh, time and to uh, allow us to get right on to the bottling process. So what I'll do first is I'll take the, the bottling bucket, put it on the floor, take the cover off my gag wine, green apple gorgstermina, and again we're going to use our little block to put under it to tip it forward. Now if you look at the bottom of this cowboy, you will see that there is a very fine amount of sediment in the bottom. Not to be concerned about it because if you watch the last show, you know that what I'm going to use is a siphon that sits on top of that and it won't suck that uh, sediment up. So the wine that's above it, which is perfectly clear if you can see that as well, uh, will be what you wind up with in your bottles. So we'll take the top off of this, the airlock. Now this is also a good time if you want to add a little bit of uh, metabisulfite uh, to your wine to uh, preserve it longer. This is a good time to do that. Generally speaking, if you took about a tablespoon or even a couple of teaspo uh, teaspoons maybe uh, of metabisul metabisulfite and mixed it with water and poured it into the bottling bucket, uh, as you siphon out the wine, it will mix up with the wine and, and add uh, some more preserving uh, qualities to it. <clears throat> Again, here is the siphon that we have used in the past. I'm just going to shake out any excess that we have there. Drop that in. Now this is the turkey pot because they, they seem to want to curl sometime. And, And they have to time it. <clears throat> now, if you had smell o vision, like uh, Emerald says on TV, you'd be smelling a green apple, uh, a Granny Smith. That's basically what this wine tastes like and smells like. And, uh, it's an awful great smell. Uh, as far as drinking is concerned, if you like sweet wine, it's fantastic. If you're a dry wine drinker, this is probably not the kind of wine that you want to, uh, to be consuming, but it is a very easy kit to make. Uh, the initial program that I started off uh, with this wine, I told you that uh, if you're going to start off with a wine that everybody is going to be in demand for uh, and want to taste, uh, this would be the one because it's very forgiving. 
So while we're filling up this bucket, we'll take a break and we'll come back to you in a few minutes and uh, start the bot bottling process. Okay, we have uh, successfully siphoned out everything and we just be careful not to lose any of this liquid gold here. And you can clean that and the cowboy a little bit later. And let me just uh, clean a little spillage here. Okay, now we're going to uh, put the the uh, filling bucket up on, and I'm going to slide it a little bit this way so that you can get a bit of better view of the bottling. Um, this bucket contains the corks that we're going to use to uh, cork the wine with. Little uh, information on corks, there are all kinds of different corks. This, these are ac actually uh, natural corks, they come from the back of a tree, a cork cork tree um, and they're good but there are better corks out there and uh, some corks are amalgamated that is they're made up of some resin material plastic material plus cork mixed in and there are there are some that are also um, uh, completely synthetic so I'm sure you've bought wine before where you've seen a synthetic cork. It doesn't look anything like a cork. It looks like a plastic stopper, basically. But these are natural corks that I'm using today in this wine because the wine's going to be consumed uh, long before the cork disintegrates, and they will over time if it's natural cork. Uh, four or five years, they, they start to break down a little bit. But I'm not going to worry about that because four or five years, this, this uh, wine would not be drinkable. Uh, it's something that you want to consume within a couple of years, at least. All right, so um, the next thing I'm going to do is get a little bit comfortable and uh, because we're going to sit down to do the bottling process. And this is the device I talked about before. This is the filler. And as you can see, it has a metal piece at the bottom that moves. And as I push down on this, the wine will come out in the bottle. So I will insert the hose over the spigot, turn the spigot down, and turn it on, and you'll see that the wine begins to flow. So I'll move a few bottles over here, give you an idea of what it looks like to fill them. And you can see it's filling from the bar bottom of the bottle upward, pushing out the air. And you want to leave about an inch, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, at the top of the bottle uh, in addition to the cork. So if the cork is uh, an inch and three quarters or an inch and a half, then you probably need to leave about two inches to uh, two and a quarter inches somewhere in that neighborhood. It doesn't have to be precise, as long as the wine is not touching the cork. Uh, you're probably okay. If it is touching the cork, the wine might actually start tasting corky and not a pleasant taste. Move that one out of the way so that you can see this one filling. And once I uh, fill these two bottles, I'll cork them and show you how the corking process is done. And then we'll take a little break while I fill the rest of the bottles because uh, this will take a few minutes and there's no sense in you sitting there watching me filling bottles. So I just put that in that other bottle. Now, let me move the corker over here so you can see this is a floor corker, and uh, there are all kinds of corkers. Some are hand-held. Those are very difficult to use, I find. 
So this is a very good investment. You simply insert the bottle in, take a cork, put it in the top, and push down. And the bottle comes out perfectly corked. You see the, the uh, bit of air that's in between the uh, cork and the wine. That's what you want. It is about an inch. This is a little bit less than an inch maybe, but it, it'll be fine. About the same size, about the same distance. Now, another word to the wise, when you select the corks, um, obviously you need 31 corks for 31 bottles, but don't count out 31 corks, because every now and then one of these corks will be a little bit uh, off size, and it won't go in the bottle. And when that happens, you have to take it out, throw it away, and, and get another one. So I usually use about five or six more corks than I actually need. And I have them soaking. You will see the dripping. This is, again, the metabisulfite to uh, kill any bacteria that might be on those corks um, before I insert them into the bottle. So why don't we take a break? I'll continue to fill the bottles. We'll come back and show you what the end product looks like. Okay, we have uh, successfully siphoned out everything, and we we'll just be careful not to lose any of this liquid gold here. And we can clean that and the cowboy a little bit later. And let me just. Uh, a little spillage here. Okay, now we're going to uh, put the, the uh, filling bucket up on, and I'm going to slide it a little bit this way so that you can get a bit of better view of the bottling. Um, this bucket contains the corks that we're going to use to uh, cork the wine with. Little uh, information on corks. There are all kinds of different corks. This, these are ac actually uh, natural corks. They come from the back of a tree, a cork, cork tree, um, and they're good, but there are better corks out there. And uh, some corks are amalgamated, that is they're made up of some resin material, plastic material plus cork mixed in, and there are, there are some that are also um, uh, completely synthetic. So I'm sure you've bought wine before where you've seen a synthetic cork. It doesn't look anything like a cork. It looks like a plastic stopper, basically. But these are natural corks that I'm using today in this wine because the wine's going to be consumed uh, long before the cork disintegrates, and they will over time if it's natural cork. Uh, four or five years, they, they start to break down a little bit. But I'm not going to worry about that because four or five years this, this uh, wine would not be drinkable. Uh, it's something that you want to consume within a couple of years at least. All right, so um, the next thing I'm going to do is get a little bit comfortable and uh, because we're going to sit down to do the bottling process. And this is the device I talked about before. This is the filler. And as you can see, it has a metal piece at the bottom that moves and as I push down on this the wine will come out in the bottle. So I will insert the hose over the spigot, turn the spigot down and turn it on and you'll see that the wine begins to flow. So I'll move a few bottles over here, give you an idea of what it looks like to fill them. And you can see it's filling from the bar bottom of the bottle upward, pushing out the air. And you want to leave about an inch, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, at the top of the bottle uh, in addition to the cork. So if the cork is uh, an inch and three quarters or an inch and a half, then you probably need to leave about two inches to uh, two and a quarter inches somewhere in that neighborhood. Doesn't have to be precise, as long as the wine is not touching the cork. Uh, you're probably okay. If it is touching the cork, 
the wine might actually start tasting corky and not a pleasant taste. Move that one out of the way so that you can see this one filling. And once I uh, fill these two bottles, I'll cork them and show you how the corking process is done. And then we'll take a little break while I fill the rest of the bottles because uh, this will take a few minutes and there's no sense in you sitting there watching me filling bottles. So I just put that in that other bottle. Now, let me move the corker over here so you can see this is a floor corker, and uh, there are all kinds of corkers. Some are hand-held. Those are very difficult to use, I find. So this is a very good investment. You simply insert the bottle in, take a cork, put it in the top, and push down. And the bottle comes out perfectly corked. You see the, the uh, bit of air that's in between the uh, cork and the wine. That's what you want, is about an inch. This is a little bit less than an inch, maybe, but it, it'll be fine. About the same size, about the same distance. Now, another word to the wise, when you select the corks, um, Obviously, you need 31 corks for 31 bottles, but don't count out 31 corks because every now and then one of these corks will be a little bit uh, off size and it won't go in the bottle. And when that happens, you have to take it out, throw it away, and, and get another one. So I usually use about five or six more corks than I actually need. And I have them soaking. You will see the dripping. This is, again, the metabisulfite to uh, kill any bacteria that might be on those corks. Um, before I insert them into the bottle. So why don't we take a break? I'll continue to fill the bottles. We'll come back and show you what the end product looks like. Okay, we're back and we have our 31 bottles of green apple quartz Um It is recommended if you use natural cork that the bottles stay upright for at least 24 to 48 hours. And the reason for that is it takes a little time for the cork to actually settle into the bottle. And it also lets some of the air that you can press in when you put the cork in at that uh, force um, to escape. If you were to lay these on their side at this time, you would see leakage around the, uh, some of the corks. Not all of them, but some of them. So it's best to leave them up if it's natural cork. If you're working with amalgamated or synthetic cork, you needn't uh, keep them upright. You can put them in your racks right away. Now, as far as racking is concerned, this is a different kind of racking, not what we did in show five, but racks uh, for bottles to lay down in, boy, there are so many different kinds out there. You can buy prefabricated racks. You can build your own. Uh, I've built my own in the cellar here with a little help from my uh, sons and um, they work out just fine. Uh, I did run out of some room at one time, so what I did was I went to Home Depot and picked up a couple of storage racks, and those are just as good because uh, if you get a wide enough one, you can uh, lay down bottles on both sides, and there are about five or six shelves, so you can have uh, um, between 10 and, and 12 uh, batches of wine laying down on those racks as well. Some people actually uh, put them in cottons and lay the cottons down on their side and do it that way. The important thing, though, is that they be stored in a place that's cool and dry. And uh, you want a little bit of moisture, especially if you're using natural cork, to keep the cork moist so that it doesn't dry out and start leaking on you. But other than that, uh, someplace where there's no vibration and uh, not an awful lot of light, especially if it's uh, red wine. So that, that's... That's sort of the, the uh, bottling process. Now, I just want to take it one step further and 
Occasionally, you might have company over, and you might want your company to sample some of your wine. Uh, you might want to create your own label, for instance. And in this particular one, this is a uh, Merlot that I made in 2003. And if you can get a shot of that, the label is co uh, computer printed. Uh, they're easy to acquire at Staples or any place like that. And on the top, you can see that there's a seal that you would see on most bottles of wine. Uh, this is a very easy process. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll take one out and give you an idea what it's all about. They come as a sleeve, very simple sleeve. You put it over the top of the bottle, and then you invert this bottle into a, a pan of boiling water. And you do it very quickly. Uh, it's basically, you turn it upside down, hit the bottom of the pan and come out, and it shrinks so that it is, as you see it on this bottle, shrunk around the uh, neck of the bottle. So this is kind of like uh, dressing it up a little bit for your guest rather than to just have a, a plain bottle. And uh, that sometimes makes it uh, seem like it's a whole lot better wine maybe, I don't know. But uh, it's, most of them come out really well anyway. This is my uh, uh, white Merlot, watermelon white Merlot. You can come up with different labels to depict what, it, what kind of wine it is. And uh, I also have a uh, blueberry Shiraz with the blueberries on it. And again, you can get creative and uh, come up with your own uh, wine labels. It's a lot of fun. The most uh, fun you have, though, is when you get to the end of your bottling and you wind up with one glass left in that bucket. And that's the glass that you want to be tasting. So. Um, I'm glad you could join me on this one and uh, hope you come back again. Uh, I've had uh, inquiries from other people uh, to be on the show. Uh, one in particular would like to uh, have a little uh, segment on beer making as well, and it's very similar in some respects, very different in other respects. But uh, he is uh, interested in, in coming on the show and uh, giving you a little bit of update on how to uh, make beer and how it parallels making wine to some extent. So, again, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you back again.